space band All around you is the sound of laughter Joyous people celebrate a life so grand Hey mister, read that fairy tale again Ooh, I've seen it though you won't believe it It's a miracle here in which we're living Come on outside Sending waves that crash upon the sand Hey mister, did you watch slow down again? There is time for you to smell the flowers Even though the thorns get in the way Hey mister, what's your theory for today? Ooh, I've seen it afternoon good evening wherever you are in the world you have reached saturday science chats yeah after la last week's fiasco with no electricity electricity is really sort of important to uh, the modern world um we had to sort of abandon that i apologize i apologize that mike we've got mike here uh he's going to be uh, talking a little bit before uh we should get to his presentation it's really uh going to be a great one today uh of course, we're going to be talking about the aquatic ape with Mike Gimble, who actually started out, he uh, will tell a little bit about that, uh, started out as a dissident scientist, more of a person going against mainstream physics, cosmology, that kind of thing. But he said he led it, got led into this direction as well. And we're going to hear a little bit of that story before uh, his presentation. Of course, I want to thank everybody who's watching. This is uh, supported and sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science YouTube channels. I want to thank all my subscribers and all the subscribers of the CMPS YouTube channel. Hey, folks, we're going to hit a thousand, I think, before the end of the year subscribers. So that is absolutely great. You can put uh, do super chat if you're watching on YouTube, all the monies and funds to that go on this channel for super chat. That is if you want to, it's like giving a tip while you're watching YouTube. Uh, those all go toward our organization to keep this thing going. It costs about a couple thousand dollars a year. But I do want to thank all of you because without you watching and all of these people watching and recording this, of course, not would not happen of course we are where critical thinkers meet or the john chappelle natural philosophy society named after john chappelle a uh, doctoral in i can't remember i think he's from harvard uh but uh he started the uh, nps which is the Na uh, mpa natural philosophy society uh, uh, alliance and that has uh changed the same society into the john chappelle natural philosophy society in honor of him he died in 2002 but we uh, support people who uh, look at uh, uh science 
from a broader sense of cosmology and our mission is to be an organization above all that promotes critical thinking without malice an organization that supports publishes and promotes serious scientific work outside the mainstream to provide a form of open debate about modern topics in physics cosmology philosophy mathematics and other topics and to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories theories without fear of censorship and to be run and controlled entirety by our, our members, and that's a lot of you out there. Who we are, we are open to challenging mainstream science, allow and encourage competing ideas. We too follow the scientific method. I think people, that's the biggest misconception of people who are dis, what are quote unquote dissident scientists that we throw out all the rules of science and people say, well, the reason you have a different, a new theory of the universe or, or, or models of atoms or whatever is because you've thrown out all the rules and ignore all all the history and that actually it's the opposite uh who's been doing that more is in fact the uh, mainstream science they keep uh closing their eyes to all the immense problems so that's why we have so many people interested in this and uh and we also consider an idea without accepting it like aristotle and that is today oh aquatic a come on that's that's a silly idea well Keep your mind open, folks, because that's the way it always should be. When somebody like, uh, I know a little bit about it because I've seen this idea for a while, uh, a while back, but my mind's open. Um, I, I'm to be convinced, and you should be too, uh, making your, and accepting an idea with, without it. I mean, uh, 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 rejecting an idea without even knowing what it's about. That's not good. So we do give voice to the voiceless a lot of times some of these amazing minds they just can't get out there and so that's uh, what we do and of course this is always where science advances we're going to find the, the next people who are going to change science because it doesn't happen in mainstream because all they want to do obviously is support what they um, are doing um let me get my pointer out here i keep moving my mouse around uh we are not we don't have a specific point of view uh we're, a, we're not a general science organization not a new age conspiracy ufo i'm not saying people aren't interested in that but that's not what we do and why is that because you know uh challenging the big bang relativity um uh, uh light gravity fields magnetism tectonics all that kind of stuff uh, let's start with that stuff before we go off and uh look on the uh more uh <clears throat> how do you say new age and those kinds of things let's start with the fundamentals so uh that's what we are doing and of course we have our websites uh, if you are new to this you can go to beyondmainstream.org it's an online magazine for critical thinkers you're going to say what are uh, there are problems in mainstream science oh there are a lot and you can go there click on problems you'll see all the problems and you can click on each one of those problems to see lots of people who've been working that books and, and abstracts and papers all on those topics. And of course, our critical thinking community, uh, natural language, is that <laughs> natural language. I always say that so far, that's my, that's my area of making my living uh, in artificial intelligence, natural language processing. So I constantly get natural philosophy, natural processing reflects up. But natural philosophy, which is the older word for what used to be, what we call physics uh and that's our critical thinking community so go there register you can actually become a member help support us it's vital your support and uh discuss there uh with uh, like-minded people and uh we do have a wikipedia over 10,000 pages wiki natural dot org if you have your work your profile you want to put on there and you can't put it on wikipedia then you can put it on ours no it's not open because if it was it'd be just totally trash so well we we do allow you to go in there and uh build it up uh and so we got a lot of information there um we do have memberships and i do want to thank people because we do have memberships i see every month it's an automatic system part of the reason we need memberships is because even just to have memberships it costs money to to uh how do you say uh now it's renting them not renting them up uh, some they're all subscription everything that we do in software today is a subscription the the our website our our server everything including our membership system is um a subscription so it's greatly appreciated and i see those coming in every month absolutely appreciate that and of course you can do it either monthly or annually um, we accept that and of course donations which we do have uh, accept and believe me it is greatly 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 appreciated um also, some of our patrons, Nick uh, Percival, Dr. Cynthia Winthy, Ramsey, and all our, of course, monthly and, and annual memberships. We do, we need your vital support. Without that, we do not exist. Uh, I wish I was a rich guy, 
could support all this myself, but I cannot. Um, we keep pushing this back because I've been super busy with my own life here, um, you know, job surviving, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I'm looking in the November time frame to do our uh, conference. We'll have a sort of theme for it. It, it is gonna, it's beyond mainstream, but we're going to get a more specific theme for it. And we do have people already working on papers for that. And uh, I've got a couple. Oh, yeah, I've got one. Why? Ether is just not the way to transmit it. Oh, my God goodness the etherists are going to gonna hate me for that but i really just been thinking a lot about that ether just it's not the best way to transmit information okay um anyways um it is a november frame time frame uh, those who participate it will have a registration fee yes uh i think it's be between 100 and 50 150 dollars for about that and why do we do that well to do all this we need to do that uh and also help our organization so we have our proceedings um it does call have there's a cost per per page on that and uh this is sort of what it's going to be i think it's going to be thursday friday saturday and sunday um and uh it will be during the days uh, we are uh, registration opens this month it's already open uh, we'll have speakers we're going to record those presentations so people can see them and you send them to me attendees can join in on zoom zoom uh, discussions those will be open only to those people who do pay to uh pay the fee uh and you'll do this all online and we have uh everybody both speakers and attendees who do pay the registration will get a t-shirt credentials and that will be mailed to them and uh, proceedings which are now open you can send an email to me and uh, my father and we'll be available a couple weeks before the conference worldwide so you can buy those and have those in hand um, our publishing is doing great we've launched three books this year available on, on amazon no fit uh, not finity with george coin we have um ramsey's ether for over horn pay pages that's free and we have published in fact today we have our ebook we've already started selling ebook saw some sales come in today on our principia mathematica 2 uh, and uh, we'll be giving a talk on that shortly i think that'll probably be our next talk the ether by ramsey you can is publishes for free you go to the ether by ramsey.com and you can get that book and download it entirely for free it's a great book my dad worked on helping get that published and then um there it is and uh a donation if you can and uh, not affinity process matter in motion absolutely great haven't seen joint george coin we've had several i think two interviews with him he's super brilliant mind really like him he likes taking these funky pictures all the time so uh, uh but he's a really great guy and uh this is his the cover for his book uh is again available on, on amazon and this is absolutely fantastic the most important book ever written in geology in my opinion uh called uh, beyond plate tectonics it's unsettling satellite science it is now free absolutely free and if you haven't read um uh dr james max lowe's book i'm sorry you are missing if you love science and you haven't read his book shame on you it, I, I, it changes everything it changes everything it's absolutely amazing this book um and uh yeah we do have it our principia mathematica 2 published on amazon worldwide it's actually uh across all the countries i saw in japan and brazil even put our our, our things in portuguese since i do know that uh, our our um, my dad and i's um profiles are on there and the ebook was started is available and believe me ebooks are really hard to do well if you have a format for a regular book transferring that to an ebook especially with all the graphics we have we have a ton of graphics in fact in our book we have a graphics index we have an index in our book and a graphics index because people are so uh, intrigued by this being a visual model of the universe and uh believe it or not the, our best reception coming from the layman because they've never been interested much in science because when you tell people about a wave particle duality and they just don't know anything it's like uh, they don't understand that at all and then you actually give them a picture of what you say it is uh people are uh, who would have who would have guessed um that's really great we'll be giving a talk on that soon this is our cover the universe is not magic so we'll be giving a talk on that coming up and oh play coming bumper all right i will do that coming
Yes, and if you want to come and talk with us, you can. Uh, again, a complete toolkit for hacking the physical universe. We'll be talking, my father and I, father's an electrical engineer. And what's really interesting in our book is we give you physical explanations what gra gravity and light and mag magnetic fields are. No, not equations, real physicality to those. And one of the most interesting parts of it is how it is actually giving us an amazing insight onto how electronics and circuits and trans, uh, transistors and capacitors and batteries. It is absolutely fascinating. In fact, it's made predictions. My father has uh, looked in those predictions of parallel resistors that are not known. And believe it or not, uh, it looks like uh, the predictions of our model are correct. But that's one of the most amazing things is because, you know, when they talk about electricity as being current, being holes moving in the opposite direction of electrons, Give me a break, folks. Give me a break. Alrighty, but uh, next could be you. So if you do have any suggestions, please send us send them to us. I have lots of people I've been trying to line up, but I'll tell you, it's like herding cats. But uh, uh, if you do have something you want to talk to and uh, don't have an audience, and it's a ser it's serious serious scientific work talk to the physics police. That's me, and I'll be really happy to uh, talk to you about uh, presenting here. Okay, play today's bumper. Well, you saw that said 18th. Yeah, that was because it was supposed to be last week and I didn't remake the video. Sorry about that. But today we'll be talking with uh, Mike Gimbel about the Quadic Ape. And I'm going to bring him up and uh, bring this down and bring him up. And hopefully he's all ready. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. All right. We Thanks got for inviting me. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, why don't you get yourself centered there in the picture there? There you go. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm a direct. I, I made a movie, so I think you know I'm just like some big time director, really, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, <laughs> get you get you centered in the shot, cinematog uh, cinematographically. Oh, okay. So why don't you 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 had mentioned that um, it is an interesting story before we uh, uh, go in, get into your presentation. Uh, you had mentioned that this was not your work. Most people would think, oh, you've made your lifetime work on a, on the aquatic ape, but you came from really where we, most of us have come from. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, really, my whole life has been critical uh, thinking and against the mainstream and uh, pretty successfully. And about 40 years ago, I, I discovered that this is a problem in, uh, in physics. I literally... Uh, was like most of the public, I thought uh, the wonderful uh, physicists, they're all great. Let me go and uh, 40 years ago, read uh, one of these popular books to see what, what they're saying, because I wanted to catch up on that area of, of science that I had been avoiding. And I literally, uh, about page 80, threw the book against the wall, saying, this isn't physics, this is more like religion than it is science. And that started my whole uh, journey of uh, investigation of what, why is this happening in physics? And that led me first to the uh, geological and paleonto paleontological problems uh, created by the expanding earth theory, which seems so obviously correct. And uh, then I said, well, let me look at this thing about the aquatic ape, because if they're wrong in this area, maybe they're wrong in that area too. And when I read uh, Elaine Morgan's book, I, it came out to me like, this is obvious. And so the, the relativity stuff was obvious, the, uh, the expanding Earth was obvious, this was obvious. And then I, I got uh, a realization that there is no conspiracy about uh, trying to prevent people to, uh, 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 from understanding all this stuff, it, uh, there's something else going on here. And that led me to figure that the, the problem lies in the, our own brain. Uh, and I, I, I created an associate uh, video to this video that you're going to show called The Brain Only Sees What the Brain is Trained to See. And in fact, what we have is 
uh, not common sense in, uh, in the world and in science, but common belief systems. And the common belief systems are generally going to be, oh, I, I don't want to do something, I don't want to think something that's out of this mainstream. Uh, and so you have this problem of mainstream beliefs holding back science, holding back thinking. And so I just wanted uh, to preface uh, the the video, which which I don't need to go into, because the video speaks for itself. Uh, but I just want to preface that by saying that uh, the whole reason for going into this and creating this video is because we need to see critical thinking in every aspect of human life. It's not just science. It's in every aspect. And it isn't a problem of conspiracies. It isn't a problem of people protecting their jobs or anything like that. It's just the way the brain works. It's, it is a fact of life that we are tribal species and we want to blend in with the tribe. We want it so that you have a sort of a consensus thinking, not common sense that actually is taking place. So I just wanted to say that, preface that before you show the video. Okay, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, the, the brain is a neural network, so its job is to take in information and make sense of it. So if you're fed certain type of information, your brain's going to wire itself to that way. So, okay, well, listen, yeah. uh, what I'm going to do now is I'll uh, get get this started because we want to get this uh, uh, presentation uh, out and uh, watch. So uh, thank you so much. And we'll we'll bring you back when we're done with the presentation. Okay. Tremendous. Okay. Thank you. All right. We are now going to present the aquatic ape hypothesis by Mike Gimbel. Make sure um, people in the Dennis and James uh, in the green room, if you could give me a thumbs up to make sure, and you too, Mike, to, that make sure that it's actually uh, you, you can hear the video. Okay. Before we go, here we go. Comrades and friends, brothers and sisters, most of what I will be quoting here are from two books written by Elaine Morgan. The first and the most important book is entitled The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis. The second book is mostly her summation of her struggle to get a hearing together with a summation of her arguments put forth in that original book. The new book is entitled The Naked Darwinist. Now to the, uh, to the talk. We've all seen numerous NOVA television documentaries on the origin of our species. We've seen commentary on this subject for decades in books and magazines and on television. Yet never have I seen the obvious questions even asked, let alone answers to those questions. Over the years, I have wanted to scratch the itch on these very obvious questions about the origin of the human species, but not until I found Elaine Morgan's books was I presented finally with both those obvious questions and her answers that should have been obvious to anyone, not just a, sci a scientist. I'm, I'm indebted to her for what she's done in these books. It was uh, tremendous. I highly recommend that you co get a copy of Elaine Morgan's book, The, a the Aquatic Ape Hypothesis. Uh, in the following, when I say, quote, 
I will be reading a quote from one of these two books, and a good deal of the unquoted will still be paraphrases from her book, but with some additional thoughts added by me and some other uh, thoughts that are not in the book. Here's a description from the book of the, of the anthropologist methodology, which is something I'm aware of, I think and even you're aware of, but it's worth quoting because it, it is shocking, really, even though we know it. Quote, in order to construct their family trees, students are trained to concentrate on and evaluate all characteristics that are shared between related species. Any feature of any species which is not shared by any of its nearest kin is classified as autopomorphic, a one-off, an idiosyncrasy, and therefore useless, arbitrary, and irrelevant to the task at hand. To to the committed systematicists, betraying a keen curiosity about an autopomorphic trait is a sign of scientific illiteracy." Unquote. <laughs> Are you kidding? Charles Darwin would be, would be rolling in his grave in shock at such a reactionary, anti-Darwinist statement. That statement is an attack on Darwinism by supposed Darwinists. Do you remember the famous stories of how Darwin studied the finches of the Galapagos? Did Darwin look for similarities or did he look for differences in the, that led to his creation of the theory of evolution? Darwin looked for instance, to find even the most trivial differences in the finches' beaks from the different islands of the Galapagos and link those differences to the differing environments on each separated island of each of the variety of finches. It was the differences, not the similarities, which led to Darwin developing the theory of evolution. If one is to look for the environment our original human ancestor in, existed in, it cannot be found in the bones, nor can it be found in the DNA. Yes, the bones and the DNA are wonderful scientific evidence as to our connections to other species. You can, it is wonderful what they've developed in, in, in linking us tree in the tree of life. But the bones and DNA cannot tell us very much about our differences, which is so important, except in the most basic ways, in the most basic attributes. The bones and DNA cannot talk about that. So when trying to understand the environment that our most distant ancestor lived in, where shall we look first, if not at the bones and the DNA? <coughs> well, we can only look at the human body that exists, which is ours. The bo all we can do is dig up the bones of things from millions of years ago, uh, ago. We don't have bodies from them, from them with the meat attached. And even then, it, it, it would be difficult to discern a lot. Our bodies, however, tell a great story, our human bodies today, about our ancestry. And that's how Darwin would have looked at it. Humans split away from the main branch of the primates prior to the split of the gorillas and the chimps, chimpanzees. So we're not directly involved from the chimpanzees, as people probably think. 
their original ancestors come after ours. Ours actually predates theirs. So we are in a separate line. Our original ancestor arrived about five to six million years ago, before the original ancestors of the gorillas and the chimps. And they arrived probably somewhere in the area of the East African Rift Valley, most likely in the area of the Afar Triangle, a very unique area at the northeast corner of Africa where Djibouti, Eritrea, and Ethiopia come together near the very entrance to the Red Sea, opposite the Arabian Peninsula. Our human bodies did not come about by some freak accident. We have a very unique body. Yet our bodies are not only extremely different from any other primate, but distinctive in many unique, and I emphasize unique ways, from all land animals. We're very different. And if that can't have happened accidentally, survival would have developed it. We would needed this body to survive. And how did that come about? There, these differences are so extreme that it is remarkable that any real scientist could have ignored their importance. Yet that is exactly what they are doing. Let's uh, start with the most obvious. Our skin. Here, our skin. Here's a quote from Charles Darwin. Quote, No one supposes that the nakedness of the skin is of any direct advantage to man. Unquote. <laughs> if you have watched the Nova documentary you will listen to all kinds of sad attempts to explain away this problem by various anthropologists using very tortured logic, trying to make our naked skin, skin some sort of survival advantage. Hmm. If it's a survival advantage, shouldn't others have adopted it? Yet shouldn't the fact that our naked skin, which is so obviously different from other land animals, that it, it should shout out to the Darwinists this question. Quote, if no other land animal has anything similar, then what environment created how we came to be about to be so naked? These anthropologists refuse to see what is right in front of their eyes, our skin. Charles Darwin linked humans with aquatic mammals when he stated, quote, another most conspicuous difference between man and the lower mammals is the nakedness of the skin. Whales and porpoises, dugongs and the hippopotamus are naked. Unquote. Fact. Nearly all naked animals are in some degree aquatic. Fact. Nakedness under a hot sun, in a hot African sun, does not cool an animal. If you shave the hair off the back of an animal, its core temperature will go up, not down. Fur is the ideal insulator for land mammals. Our naked skin lined with fat, and that's very unusual, that lining with fat, is an asset only in a water environment. So let's follow some more facts. The, human, the linkage of humans to aquatic creatures does not stop at the surface of the skin. The linkage to an aquatic existence is repeated over and over 
all over and inside our bodies. Inescapable linkages. I do statistical analysis. If the nakedness of the skin was the sole issue, we couldn't make any definite conclusion based upon that single item. But with fact following fact, as I will list here, an aquatic ancestor becomes an irresistible conclusion. Let's start with the next obvious item that the anthropologists refuse to see, even though it is right in front of their eyes. Our erect posture. You can't miss it. <laughs> like the skin, we're standing straight up. The silliness of the Nova documentaries is the anthropologists try, uh, trying to claim that our erect posture, running on two legs, was developed in hunting the great African herds on the African savanna. Only one little teeny weeny problem. The African savanna did not exist at that time of our last common ancestor. The savanna is, and the great herds is a more recent development than from when our human ancestor first appeared. Therefore, we can simply dismiss those NOVA programs about those great hunters on the African savanna entirely out of hand at least as regarding how our erect posture developed. The hunting on the uh, savanna did occur, but much later in the time of Homo erectus. Fact, no other animal or on land or on, in the sea habitually resorts to this erect mode of locomotion. Nobody. It is utterly unique. How our erect form of locomotion came about, therefore, must have also been completely unique. Is it not obvious that something absolutely astounding taking place in the environment must have occurred which forced this unusual mode of locomotion? a load of locomotion upon our original ancestor. Ah. And the proper word used in that last sentence is forced, as it is not an advantage to be erect in terms of locomotion. Otherwise, we would not be alone in having that method of from going from a from point A to point B. There would be dozens, if not hundreds, of other creatures would have found that to be a successful form of motion. So how did we end up with this unique erect form of locomotion? This is the question that has to be answered properly under the correct conditions. Quote, by far the commonest, the most common cause of speciation, the creation of species, is a period of geographical isolation. Full isolation, not a little isolation. Geographical isolation, you're in a separate place. Speciation without separation is so rare that Ernst Mayer doubted whether it really ever happened, or ever occurred, unquote. Quote, among larger mammals, the commonest cause of geographical isolation is a sheet of water, unquote. Fact, Lucy's bones were found in the Afar Triangle. What is unique about the Afar Triangle that makes it so important in the story of human origin. The Afar Triangle is a unique place 
where the Indian plate, the Arabian plate, and the African plate all meet. It is one of the most active tectonic locations on the Earth's surface with lots of volcanoes. The Apar Triangle is the under portion of re what remained of the Arabian Peninsula at the mouth of the Red Sea, which suddenly split apart from the African plate, with the Red Sea suddenly flooding much of the Afar Triangle, which is below or the below portion behind, below that uh, Arabian plate that pulled apart, with the water flooding that area like a tidal. The Afar Triangle today is a mostly arid region, very arid, including the Danakil Alps and the Danakil Depression, which is a relic of the flooded area, a depression on the land that is now some 509 feet below sea level and filled with the salt that remains from the ocean created from the sudden burst of the sea that entered the Afar Triangle when the split from Africa occurred. The Danica Alps remained above sea level after the flood, but remained isolated as an island away from the African continent for an extensive period until the Afar Triangle's link with the ocean dried up millions of years later. Any primate after that tidal wave, after that flood came in, isolated on that island now separated from the African continent, was now living under conditions which create the possibility of rapid speciation as described previously, separated by water. Darwin showed how islands separated by a large bodies of water created the conditions for rapid speciation. Question, is there direct evidence that a human descendant lived on that island? No. But it is a likely location because it meets the many requirements that the following evidence points to. One, we need a location in or near the East African Rift Valley, where almost all, every bone has been found, we, of every fossil. We two, we probably need a location near where Lucy's bones body was found in the Afar Triangle, which is at the north end of the East African Rift Valley. We need a location that is sufficiently separated from the African continent that, that was away from contracting the baboon retrovirus, something that I will be getting to shortly. Four, we need, I believe, a location that is adjacent to the ocean due to the need for the availability of year-round sufficient food of high energy value, which I will also deal with shortly. This last requirement may or may not have played a role in the development of Homo erectus uh, 2.5 million years ago. I'll get to that possibility at the end of my talk. The isolated Danical Alps Separated from the African mainland by that sudden flood, flood several million years ago fills the bill as a, as a likely location. Could be others, but this is the one that seems to fill the, fill the bill where most, our most distant ancestor was likely to have been born. Let me give you some more facts to show you that erect posture could not have originated on land. Quote, all the animals which have abandoned quadrupedalism, or moving on four feet, have done it because they have abandoned walking on the ground." Unquote. The earliest bipeds, 
our ancestors, our Homo ap ancestors, that is the date back uh, before Homo erectus, back to our original ancestor, did not run the way we did, fully erect. They used a gait which the experts call BHBK, bent hips, bent knees. That mode of locomotion, that form of locomotion is far more energetically costly and unstable than our modern form of bipedalism. Our original ancestor could not have efficiently run at either after game or away from predators. When we run, we use far more energy than a, a quadruped does. Yet our human ancestor running BHBK would have used even far more energy in a far less efficient manner. So why would our evolutionary forces for survival purposes, purposes have found BHBK to be an advantage to that ancestor? It wouldn't. It couldn't. Survival on land with a mode of locomotion of BHBK would be highly unlikely. What environment would have an erect posture been an advantage? Answer, really only in shallow water, by the ocean or the river's edge, by wading into it. And when you wade, you're standing erect. There must have been something that threatened our ancestors' very survival to force it to wade into water. Why would wading be required for survival? The Danical Alps are mostly barren today, and likely then as well. Food scarcity forces all animals, when they uh, move, when they have scarcity, they move. They move to areas where food is more available. But what if moving is prevented? Because you're on an island. A group of intelligent primates finding themselves suddenly isolated on a mostly barren island, separated from Africa by a vast ocean, would have had to find the only food available, and it would be at the ocean's edge. Most primates, when crossing streams, I'm not talking about our ancestors, I'm talking about all our primate uh, relatives. When most primates, when they cross streams or rivers or, or go into a swamp, they, they use the erect posture. It's the most efficient way to do it in the, under those conditions. Wading is not something that primates cannot do. They do it. For a primate isolated on such an island, the process of evolution would have given survival advantage to the best waders and swimmers. Our erect posture makes no sense any other way because no other a mammal, no other mammal has adopted such a posture. If an erect posture were, there, were an evolutionary advantage, there would be dozens, if not hundreds, of other mammalian species which would have adopted it, it. If it is such an advantage, why haven't gorillas and chimpanzees and lions and tigers adopted an erect posture? They didn't simply because an erect posture is a big survival disadvantage for both prey and predator land and mammals. One minor note, there is only one area on the human body that has luxurious hair on it. Hmm. The top of your and my head, uh, well, unless you're bald, okay. But on the top of all our heads, when we're, especially when we're young, many, my question to you, <laughs> what area of our body is exposed to the African sun, the hot African sun, when wading in, in chest-deep water. 
You got it, the top of your head with the hair on it. Needed to protect from the sun's heat. What other land mammal has such an arrangement of its fur? None. It's another uniqueness for us that points in only one direction. Fact. Lucy's bones. That fossil born in the Afar Triangle, which we're talking about, were found eroding from sand which also contained the remains of crocodile eggs and turtle eggs and crab claws, unquote. Fact, quote, almost all the Rift Valley hominid fossils are the remains of creatures who died by the water's edge, unquote. The anthropologists can complain all they want about the fact that the water's edge is a natural place to find any remains. But it is a very weak argument, especially due to the fact that the entire East African Rift Valley is filled with the lakes and rivers that were created by the same tectonic process that created the Afar Triangle. It is an area of enormous tectonic activity. I do not think that it is an accident that our species was created in such an area of violent and sudden environmental change. Fact, all primates native to Africa carry a retrovirus. All primates native to Africa carry a retrovirus which protected their ancestors from the baboon infection, the plague, when it was at its most virulent, unquote. Huh. Okay. All primates native to Africa. That's us. Our ancestors are native to Africa. However, there is one African primate that does not carry the baboon vera, a virus, retrovirus. Hmm, who could that be? Homo, me and you, we don't carry it. How is that possible? Every single one, that every primate in Africa at the time got it. And it was a plague, and you couldn't have avoided it. Well, that means that our answer, sir, Hmm. was not living on the African continent at that time. Could not have been. It's impossible. It had to be elsewhere. Yet it is clear from all the homo remains, all the fossils found, that those ancestors lived in the East African Rift Valley and, and, and the Afar Triangle where Lucy was found. Question, at that time, what was far enough away from the African mainland, yet still part of the Af Afar Triangle, not that far away? And now, and it's part of the Africa now. It was the Danical Alps. Today, part of the African continent, but at that time was an isolated island in the Red Sea. Now let's look at the next issue, <laughs> just a, uh, slightly further. Let's look under the skin. There are two <coughs> classes of mammals which are liable to accumulate large quantities of adipose tissue. It's a fancy word for fat. They are either the hibernating mammals uh, and, and the aquatic mammals. However, the hibernators only do so seasonally. Only, you know, for when they have to hibernate. Aquatic animals are the only ones that have large quantities of adipose fat year round. Twelve months out of the year. Only, only the aquatic animals. Except there's one more. One more. 
So there isn't an only. And it's a supposedly non-aquatic species. You can guess it. Yes, it's me and you, the human. Gee, that link seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? But they don't notice it. And I'm not talking about your fat belly. Our fatness is a human feature. It's under all our skin, as distinct as our naked skin itself, and as distinct as our bipedalism, and all these features, the naked skin, erect, erect posture, and fatness, have only one thing in common, a water environment. There is a, this unique fat is under, it's a unique set of fat under the human skin. Most marine animals have a thick layer of fat under the skin, and smaller freshwater aquatics, like the beaver, typically have a higher proportion of body fat than their nearest non-aquatic relatives. In our case, we have 10 times the number of fat cells for an, a mammal of uh, averaging our si similar size. And we do not resemble the primates in any way in this matter. A. H. Schultz wrote that infant monkeys and apes, quote, resemble in their faces emaciated and toothless old men, but human babies are born well padded with a remarkable amount of subcutaneous fat, unquote. Quote, a well padded human baby can float on the surface of the water without any support, unquote. Why would that be? Hmm. Some babies have even been videoed enjoying swimming. No, no, no. Why would that be too? Okay. Quote, Rose Frisch stated that if a woman's adipose tissue, her fat, constituted less than 17% of her body weight, she ceases to menstruate and cannot reproduce, 17%. Yet in many wild animals, remain, they remain perfectly healthy and reproductive with less than 3% body fat. Out on this, on the non-existent savanna where the anthropologists roam, along with the non-existent great herds at that time, this enormous amount of fat would have been a huge disadvantage to our ancestor. Our ancestor would have been slowed down, both in fleeing predators and chasing prey, by the extra weight of the fat it carried. In addition, a fat baby that is also utterly helpless and incapable of walking or even grabbing the fur onto her mother's naked body would have been a huge disadvantage for the survival of any female primate. The ancestor female, if she were on land, running erect, would have to carry this fat and heavy baby in her arms while trying to escape predators, while running BHBK, bent hip, bent, bent knees. Don't make no sense to me. She'd have been easy prey. A quadrupedal primate on all fours with a baby that isn't born so helpless and fat can quickly escape predators with the baby clinging to the fur on its mother's back. Carrying the extra weight of the, ancest of the ancestor's body fat is also energy expensive. Carrying that extra weight makes no sense for their survival. Yeah. It needs even more food to survive because it's carrying all that weight. Nonsense. Our human ancestor walking erect while carrying that extra weight, while covered by naked skin under the African sun, that would have caused them to sweat profusely, wasting a prodigious amount of water 
does not make a lot of sense for a land of mammal that originated far away from a substantial body of water. Mark Verhagen said that humans have to drink more water than any other terrestrial mammal. Dehydration of about 10% may be fatal to humans, whereas most animals can rec rapidly recover from a dehydration of double the amount of 20%, which suggests that man evolved where water was permanently and abundantly available. The issue of overheating in land mammals is handled almost uniquely by humans. Again, we're unique. Just in, ca in case you know, no, no, everything is unique. And here we go again. Our ape relatives deal with heat by panting, as do almost all other land mammals. Only in rare and extreme situations do humans pant. We sweat. We sweat enormous amounts of water from our bodies when out in the hot sun. So why did we give up panting? Why? What forced us to give up panting? Really, because survival of the fittest, that means you got forced to do this. And everybody else is panting, so that's, that is the survival way. This is not a minor artifact. This is a major difference that is linked to our method of breathing. Ah, breathing, that's kind of fundamental too, isn't it? And the anthropologists haven't noticed that we do breathe differently. I think they, they see it, they just don't, the brain don't accept it. Why haven't the anthropologists noticed this obvious difference? Would not Charles Darwin immediately have inquired as to why this came about? This difference must have survival importance for our species. It is not accidental. We must have given up panting for a survival reason. It is not some inherited artifact that can be ignored. But these well-trained anthropologists do so anyways. Breathing is a fundamental act. How we breathe tells us a lot about our ancestors. Breathing is different for an aquatic mammal from a land mammal. Aquatic animals must be able to hold and control their breath. Isn't that obvious? They must be able to hold and control their breath when in water and diving. Land animals do not have such a need. They don't have to dive and to swim. They don't need to have to control their breath. Land mammals, for the most part, are nose breathers that cannot control their breathing, while humans, while running or swimming, are mouth breathers, and we can control our breathing. When the doctor asks to, for us to hold our breath, we do so. Something an ape cannot do it is why an ape cannot talk, even if it's so desired. Our descended larynx is key to the human breathing control. The descended larynx has only been found in, guess again, what do you say? What, what type of animal? The dugong, the walrus, and the sea lion. Hmm, what's in common? Oh yes, they're all aquatic. This shows that the link to an aquatic origin for the descended larynx is completely obvious. Yet these wonderfully trained anthropologists fail to see it again. What is right in front of their eyes? Once again, the brain only see what it is trained to see. Only they own the brain, these are single cell animals, they're not very intelligent in there, no matter how, how many you have. And they have to be trained to see things. And once again, the brain only see what it is trained to see. Our neurons are very conservative single cell and unintelligent animals. The descended larynx allows for breath control. 
In the gorilla and all the primates, the larynx, as in most mammals, is at the back of the mouth, preventing food from the mouth to enter the windpipe. In humans, the descended larynx creates a situation situation where the entrance to the food canal and the windpipe lie side by side. Charles Darwin thought that this was a crazy arrangement which would allow food and drink to cause choking and food to enter the lungs. There is only one environment where mouth breathing and control of breathing is an advantage to a mammal. That advantage is only gotten in an, an aquatic environment, in swimming and diving, in order to, to gulp large quantities of air. The only species, and not only gulp it, but to hold it at, when you're diving, the only species that share with us the ability to take a deep breath to control our CO2 levels are diving species of aquatic birds, aquatic reptiles, and aquatic mammals. Hmm, well, there's a strange link again. The diving response, breath control, in fact, of trained human divers is similar in range to the beaver and the otter. Hmm, what's the similar? They're also aquatic, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Now let's move on to the sense of smell. Why right, we're covering everything in the body, and it all links one way. Irresistible conclusions. <laughs> one irresistible conclusion it links towards. Whales and dolphins have discarded the sense of smell. It is of no use to them. They have no olfactory bulb in their brains. Hmm. So what's with the uh, olfactory bulb in humans? You guessed it. Our olfactory bulb is less than half the size of the gorilla and the chim chimpanzees. Hmm. The sense of smell would have been less of, of less use for our aquatic ancestor than for our primate relatives. Oh, you think I'm at the end? Not yet. <laughs> now let's look at the human hair on our bodies. Oh, the human hair is also going to like us to aquatic? Yeah, 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 yeah. You guessed it. We have ha as many hair follicles as our primate relatives, but the hair that emerges did not extend very far from the follicles. But they're there. We got just as many as they do. It's the aura the orientation of the hair that emerges from the follicles that is once again unique, again that magic word, the unique among the primates, and is in opposition to almost all other mammals. <laughs> we, are, we are just a body full of unique. None of our human hair grows in the same direction as the hair of our primate relatives. There, hair grows in a different direction entirely. Instead, our bodily hair growth direction, the direction of the hair, actually flows in the same direction as water flows around our bodies. Oh, gee, why would that be? Oh, yeah, I can't guess it. I guess I just don't know. Maybe you could figure, uh, get, venture a guess as to why that might be. Oh, is that enough? No, we've got more to go. Now let's take a look at our blood. Yes, the blood's different too. <laughs> Marine mammals have a reduced number of red blood cells per unit volume. That's like, and we do too. Chimpanzees have an average of 7.3 million red cells per cubic millimeter of blood. Gorillas, a little less at 6.3 million and humans, far less, have just 5.1 million red cells. Aquatic mammals have a higher hemoglobin content per unit volume than is found in land, land mammals of similar size. 
and we follow right along, the percentage of hemoglobin per cell is about 12.2 for chimpanzees, a little higher for gorillas at 13.2, and a whopping 18.6 for humans. And again, we're like those ornery aquatic uh, mammals. So even our own blood, in terms of red cells and hemoglobin, is shifted in the direction of aquatic animals and away from our own ape relatives. Last but not least, our brain. And this is not so much, uh, there's a partial uh, attachment here towards the aquatic, and it has to do with the food. But since it is linked, I, I must include it here, because it is so different from, our brain is also unique away from our uh, primate ancestors and, uh, and the requirement for how it got large, so large, is part of this story and, it, and it's likely to have had an aquatic origin based on the food needs of this brain. This is an intriguing and it's a, it's a more difficult subject than all the previous that I gave. In terms of how our brains developed, it's the extremely greedy energy intensive organ that it has become, using up 25% of our entire body's energy. Susanna Herculano Jose wrote a wonderful book entitled The Human Advantage, MIT Press. She actually dedicated herself to count the number of brain neurons that the humans have. And she found that our brains have about 86.1 billion neurons on average. She also tried to figure out how it was possible for the human brain to get so large. The brains of our eight relatives are limited to 300 cc, simply because there is no way that their diet of raw foods could supply enough energy, at least the raw foods on land, could supply enough energy to allow for their brain to evolve any further than 300 cc. It's just not possible on that diet. While a larger brain would have allowed for greater intelligence and a better survival capability, there is, just was no way that their, their diets of raw foods could supply enough energy to permit any increase in brain, brain, brain size, brain growth beyond, beyond the 300 cc limit. In her wonderful book, she believed that she solved this energy problem because the brain started so quickly to increase the, in size with Homo erectus, which began to take place simultaneously with the discovery of fire, which then led to cooking of the food, which then allowed the release of enough energy for use by this greedy brain, greedy growing brain, because cooking food is a form of pre-digestion of the food, allowing the digestive system greater access to the energy contained in that food. And it's a wonderful and it's a full explanation of what happened with Homo erectus after, but only after, the discovery of fire and cooking. And that is where I have a problem with that part of the story. I agree that cooking and the food enabled the brain to go, grow after the discovery of fire and the development of the uh, cooking. I, I, but I find that it is putting the horse before the cart, however. No ape with those 300 cc's at the max has any ability to discover fire, to use fire, let alone take the next step and develop the technique of cooking using that fire. That is, that is far beyond any of the creatures that we know of that have uh, that limitation, that size brain. 
for those separate innovations, those two separate in innovations, you already have to have a brain that's larger than 300 cc's. And that cannot have happened on the African savanna. It's impossible. It is clear from the fossil record that Homo erectus is the ancestor that the brain increase started with. There is no uh, argument from me on that. <coughs> However, its brain must have started to increase prior to the discovery of fire and to the cooking of food. And that's not possible on the savannah. The cooking of food is what led to Homo erectus developing into the hunter on the savanna and moving away from an aquatic environment and allowing for the huge increase in brain size. But that happened second, not first. That happened after. So how did the brain start to get a little bit bigger? How could it? If, you, if, they, uh, if they hadn't found fire, they hadn't developed the use of fire, hadn't developed the cooking. Okay. So, what's the problem on the savanna? What's the biggest problem? Because of, of, away from water, there, uh, the Homo erectus would have been away from any abundant food source that is available year-round, that that brain needs. It, it, and you need, to, there's a big food requirement. It can't be solved on, uh, on the savanna. The food on the savanna is seasonal. And in many t parts of the year, the food available is extremely slim. The brain's needs are constant and could not have been met on, on, a, a, on the savanna where the food availability varies enormously. So something had to happen first, and it could only have happened where there was a constant, abundant, and good source of food readily available and easily digestible and that ain't on the on the savanna and in addition and even worse so the an abundant food supply constant would have especially been needed by any pregnant and nursing females it's an impossibility without for an animal prior to the discovery of fire. A large brain requires constant feeding, but Homo erectus must have, at the start, have had a brain larger than 300 cc's to master fire and invent cooking. How do we solve this chicken and egg dilemma? The only solution that comes to mind is that there must have been a source year-round of abundant, high-quality, easily digested food where Homo erectus or any, uh, a, an immediate predecessor that led to him lived that permitted a small increase in brain size that then led, that then led to the discovery of fire and to cooking. The only place to find such an abundant food source that is available year-round is on the coastal waters of the continental shelf in tropical lat latitudes. Once again, an aquatic origin rears its head. Only one problem Homo erectus began its existence only 2.5 million years ago, many millions of years after our original ancestor. Ah, it's an interesting, going from there to there. What this says to me 
is that the aquatic air, air ape period was not a momentary event. It says to me that there is a direct line from our original ancestor to Homo erectus. Homo erectus may have hunted on the savanna, but Homo erectus could not have started out that way. <clears throat> the clue that Homo erectus may still have been at least semi-aquatic, and maybe more than semi-aquatic, comes in its nose. Yep, now we're down to the nose. You thought I got everything, right? Okay, now we got the nose. Our noses point downwards, towards the chin, while most old world primates' noses point forward, and new world primates' noses point out to the sides. So we have this uniqueness again. Our noses have a nasal spine that causes the nose to point downwards. That spine serves a useful purpose. For what? For humans who dive head first into water or swim below the surface. It prevents water from being forced up into the nostrils, which would happen to our ape relatives. Gee, what a nice inco coincidence. In humans, the bridge of the nose acts like a prow in the water, deflecting the water to the side. Yes, even our noses point to an aquatic ancestor. So why does this constitute a link to Homo erectus? Huh, this nosal spine wasn't there in our original ancestor. It only arrives about 2.5 million years ago, exactly around the time of the beginning of Homo erectus. They arrive at the same time, the spine and the, well, and the species. Hmm. It is Homo erectus, or the very immediate predecessor of Homo erectus, that discovered fire and its use in cooking, which only then then allowed for the huge increase in brain size that quickly developed. The nasal spine, in my thinking, may also indicate that the act of diving was a recent development for Homo erectus and may not have been existing so much with the BHBK people. Uh, and they have some link with that sudden beginning of brain growth with the act of diving allowing them to get better quality food. Homo erectus walked more erect than our original ancestor that used the, that bent hip, bent knees, BHPK form of locomotion. Homo erectus was more like us in this respect with a more erect posture. Perhaps this greater erect posture also led to a greater efficiency in its ability to both dive and swim. I do not see an alternative explanation of why the nasal spine only appeared along with Homo erectus. And I'll, I'm, now I've ended, I leave it there at this, I'll, there's probably more things I could add, but I'm gonna leave it there. I hope that I have given you enough to think about on this question. For myself, I cannot see any alternative theory to challenge the aquatic ape hypothesis. Again, let me thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed my presentation of these facts surrounding our human origins. Again, thank you. Okay, um, let's bring up, uh, uh, get this done, get this done. <laughs> you got to get off of YouTube real quick to start. Very, very, very good, very good. Okay. I even have a uh, quote from outside of that that I'll, I'll, I'd like to read at some point. Okay, I'm sorry, just go ahead. I had to stop something going on my computer. Say that again. I, th there's a quote I have. I
pulled down from the internet at, uh, at some point I'd like to read to sort of supplement what I uh, wrote in, uh, uh, what I spoke about in the video. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the uh, item is, uh, goes like this. Barbara Harper, RN, founder of Water Birth International, a nonprofit organization that makes, that helps make giving birth in water an available option for moms to be, and Michelle Collins, CNM, an assistant professor of nursing at Vanderbilt University School of Nursing, who specializes in nurse midwifery, explain why water may lessen labor pain. When women get into de the deep water of a birth pool, not just a shallow bathtub, there is a chemical and hormonal response that adjusts the level of, of the hormone oxytocin, which pumps from the brain and helps regulate the intensity of the contractions. So as the body becomes buoyant in the deep water and more oxytocin is released, more pain inhibiting endorphins flood the mother's brain, putting her more quickly into an altered state of consciousness and allowing her body to do the work that it needs to do. What's more, Harper and Collins says, water causes the perineum to become more relaxed, which can reduce the severity of vaginal tearing. Now, to me, uh, that also speaks to uh, the whole process of, of what I was talking about. You have a body that is uh, giving birth, and the area where it's most uh, able to give birth with the least problem is in water again. So it is, uh, you know, it's just a little piece of evidence. It, I didn't put that into the video because I wanted to keep it straight on the, on, on the items that are very clear. This, uh, uh, this is a supplemental item. Uh, there are other supplemental items that I could uh, go into too that, but that, but uh, I wanted to keep the, uh, the video itself narrow. But I, now that we've played the video, I wanted to throw in that, for instance, as an additional item. Okay. Yeah. No, I've heard of that, and it somewhat makes sense, though, too, because you know, a, a babies live in in water, right? I mean, they live in water right. until they're born. So, right. yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we have some uh, people saying, "Great video, awesome." Uh, incredibly interesting, engaging talk. Well done, sir. So. Uh, um, I, I think the evidence is quite amazing. I think the thing about the skin is something I think a lot of people really think about, but they really don't address in their head because you see yeah. what you see is the the you know the the most famous evolutionary picture from the ape, you know, and the and even the walking part, and then you have upright, and all of a sudden you go from hairy to non hairy. Uh, that that certainly is a big one that people don't seem to address in anthropology at all. Do, do anthropologists, what are their ex explanations for that, that one problem? They don't. That's the whole point. We, what I was saying, they were, they're anti-Darwinists. They don't want to look at the differences. They only want to look at the similarities. But, but the way a Darwinist uh, wants to answer questions is to look at the differences and see how the environment has cha changed the species to adopt to that uh, uh, different environment. So you, what you have is, yeah, uh, a, a otter and its relatives on land, their bodily structures are almost identical. But it, you can't uh, know uh, why one is different from the other unless you look at the differences. And that is avoided as one-offs, as they say, in uh, in the Afro anthropologists, it's 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 it's, it's an anti-Darwin, uh, just like in physics, uh, you have these relativists who are really anti-physics, anti the basic laws of physics, so and basic laws of logic as well. So uh, um, that's my answer. I think I think one of the the things I that I think about, I mean, the the evidence that you give, there's a lot of really great evidence for um, the link between aquatic mammals and ourselves, and um, and and one of the things I was wondering, 
what kind of environment would these people live in? I mean, you're living along the coast, but the idea is what would, you know, even if you were an isolate, there's a couple of things. One is you've got the geological uh, explanation of the isolation, which I think is is fantastic. I think that's a really big step. Uh, in and what you said, I think the argument of that when you isolate on an island, even even if it's a few miles apart, you get same species going in very different directions, um, and that's how real change changes evolves. So I think that is a very strong argument. What what would be sort of I mean. If, if this were a more well-known or, or accepted idea that, that we need to look into this, this um, idea of the aquatic ape being part of our evolution, not all of it, but part of it, and a very important shaping part, what would be the lifestyle? Where would they live? I mean, uh, is, it, is it only, for instance, are there, oh, here's a question I had was, uh, if you're along the sea and on the coast, you're in salt water, is that correct? Yes, you would be in salt water. So is there a difference between any types of aquatic between salt water and fresh water, or that doesn't seem to make any difference? Well, the fact that uh, we sweat so much, uh, some speculation, I, I, uh, Elaine Morgan sort of dismisses it to some extent, but then also leaves it out as a question because we, uh, between our tears and our sweat, we, a lot of salt uh, is expelled. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that, that answers the question, but uh, it, it's something that uh, I didn't put in because really it, it's a question that we, uh, I can't really answer because w it, it, we need more investigation there. In, but in terms of an isolated island, which is essentially devoid because it's the top of a mountain of, of, of food sources, you're driven to the ocean for that food uh, to wade in, in there uh, as, as a survival uh, 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 tactic. In addition, you cannot uh, uh, use uh, tr uh, your arms for tree climbing mm. Uh, uh, as well, if you are, if your offspring are uh, fat and naked, because uh, the baby, uh, our babies, cannot even lift their heads, and so uh, a uh, uh, an animal, BHBK, mother, holding a heavy baby, cannot that cannot hold on to her, cannot climb into trees. The baby uh, will be subject to fall and die. Uh, it, tree climbing is, uh, a, a, you know, a way to escape. Can't happen in that type of uh, animal. And she can't run away, being BHPK, carrying that uh, baby. The only uh, location where you can have some protection in an animal in that type of uh, story is in the water, wading into the water. So uh, that's. Uh, that's the best I can answer it there. Okay, here's another question. How do how do you sweat in water? And the other person said, uh, uh, I guess if water is cool, you won't sweat. I'm not. These are. This is the sweat question. What what what? Well, what would obviously, be an answer? Uh, a wading animal spends a lot of its time out of water. Uh, uh, um, so uh, I'm not talking about sweating in water. That, right. That, if you think that's my what I was saying, that's not what I was saying. Right. right. It, so, this is hot African sun. Hot African sun. Uh, spending a lot of the time out of the water and uh, expelling the salt or whatever uh, uh, more efficiently with heavy sweat and so on. Uh, uh, so. But again, I didn't put that into the uh, video because it's more conjectural. Okay, so you're saying uh, obviously uh, humans lived on the coast. They didn't live in the water. They lived near the water and were in it a, quite a lot. I know. I know. There's also a, a quite a quite a bit of uh, 
ability for humans to hold their breath and, and to swim. Uh, I know, I think uh, one of the interesting things I saw, I remember when I was a kid that I saw on TV, like an anthropology type of TV show, National Geographic, I don't know what, but was the uh, pearl divers, where you would have, you would have right. these people mm -hmm. go into the water and they could just hold their breaths for an immense amount of time. And, you know, and, and I think the other thing too is interesting i always thought was interesting is if you take babies who are like really super young i mean uh months old and you see the russian um, uh russians throw their babies right into the water and the babies themselves they have somebody there to push them to the surface but most of the time they get up to the surface and they're totally like swimming no problems they feel very uh, it, it seems to be a very natural thing to them um i think that's sort of I'll always sort well, of. Well, they float. They can float. Uh, a, 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 a primate baby can't float. It doesn't have the fat there. There. Uh, uh, so why would we? Why would we be able to float? What was the invo uh, the uh, uh, force that created the need for us to float as a baby right out of the womb? Right. Right. Understood. Yeah. And uh, okay. Um, if you have a question, I'm reading the questions here. Um, there was. Uh, some comments, I think, in the private chat here, um, talking about bipedal dinosaurs. Um, that's a like a Tyrannosaurus rex, right? It was one of the few dinosaurs I think that actually walked on two legs. Is I mean, that's a very uh, how do you say? In my opinion, a very small sample of some something that was bipedal. But um, you were you were mentioning that the bipedal part of Human beings. But they're also tripedal, really, because they have the table. Yeah. Right. You're right. Right. So okay. It, it, so that's kind of uh, not exactly the same. Right. That's not right. quite bipedalism. Right. No, that makes sense. Now, another question I had too was about when you're standing up, and I understand in water g getting around, is I guess that would be attributed to going and get after food in the water walking walking through water to get get food is that the idea of how that works i'm sorry to trying to get a picture of uh sure. the aquatic apes lifestyle right. what what forced them because you know you, you know you would imagine you'd think of water world where you know there was <laughs> the ground was all, all under six you know four feet of water so you have to walk everywhere and you live in you know but i mean I'm, what would be a reason for the the aquatic ape then to do the the, the you know the walking upright um, if they don't live just in a water world where they have to walk through water constantly because they they're on the uh, the top of the Danical uh, mountains which are uh, barren essentially of, of food you uh, you have uh, crabs and, and clams and and other uh, uh, food sources at, right at the uh, water's edge, both uh, uh, just uh, off the water and in the water. That would lead the uh, 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 the animal, the original ancestor, to find the the only source of food needed uh, uh, there, and that would take us one step at a time further into the water but the initial would probably almost be like scavenging in, 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 uh, to get food source that is immediately available and the only food source immediately available is in uh, a wading area where you could find uh, if, uh, if you've ever gone clamming you know that there is uh, you can find lots of clams uh, uh, immediately available you have crabs you have other things and that would lead once you find that, that would lead to necessarily to further uh, exploration uh, of, for further uh, food sources. Um, how long would this aquatic um, part of our uh, evolution have lasted? Um, do you have uh, any idea on that from what you've looked into? Well, the only thing we can uh, know is that the uh, five or six million years go back uh, to the Lucy and so on. And Homo erectus is like two and a half million. So you have that period of three plus million years. 
of, of change. Now, uh, we don't have enough specific information to know what the stages are in, in that development between we, it is, all we can do is look at it where our bodies are today and look at uh, what uh, the structures of those two, of uh, Lucy was, of Homo erectus was, and anything intermediate. So I, I can't give you that specific, but, uh, but you can see that there is a transition and uh, mm -hmm. how that transition, what are the interruptions what are, you know, where were the leaps that took place? We, that is yet to be found. So what we see is a, uh, a, uh, uh, an interrupted uh, picture. We see what we have at the Homo erectus. We see what we have at, uh, at Lucy. We see what the necessary uh, environment would be for the creation of, of Lucy, for the creation of the Homo erectus. And we try to figure out what's in between. Okay. Okay. One of the interesting things that I've looked I've looked into on the human anatomy side is uh, plant based. I, I switched to a whole plant based diet in, eight years ago. Um, I was told heart disease was in my family. I had arthritis, allergies, and everything. And then when I went to whole plant based diet, my heart disease went away. My uh, and and then I started looking into well, what are we? And then I, I saw a really great video by a paleontologist who studies literally her whole life study is diet now it, yes um, uh, obviously humans ate meat but what what the what she was saying was interesting and if you look at the physiology the intestinal length that we have the teeth that we have the um, um, other other aspects of what of, of, of our being shows we are line up very closely to frugivores. Yeah, we are, I agree with you. We are very different from obviously other animals, but um, the frugivores, and if you look at our test intestines alone, you know, if you are a meat eater, you have to have as a certain type of, you know, length of intestine. Otherwise, it's just not good for you. And we also know that f just from studies of over a, m a million people in China, that plant based seems to be the ideal fruits vegetables and nuts and you can and we have you know hippos only eat plants elephants only eat plants uh gorillas only eat plants but um so so the idea that it's also being challenged one of the things i was i wanted to, to mention to you one of the ideas being challenged is that um this whole idea that you have to eat meat and for in other words to make you know this brain thing happen i think that argument is a little you know less strong but i was curious for, you, for from from your point of view where we have you know uh, obviously if you look at the chart there's a really nice chart about all of these characteristics we have in common with the frugivores how that would um, sort of in with aquatic you know be with aquatic ape um, I think the idea that when you have to, you can get things from the um, uh, sea, but not only, for instance, on the edge of, of tropical paradise, you have lots of fruits, you have tubers, you have a lot of things other than than meat. And of course, the only thing we really have evidence for in the long term are bones. You don't find bones from broccoli, right? You don't, you can't find that. So one of the things about the paleontologists, what they're doing is they look at the teeth and they can find stuff on the teeth that they can do now analysis on the DNA. And they find that in fact, in general, we were our bodies adapted to be more plant eaters, but that there, for instance, there were um, some of the ideas were if you live, for instance, you're a human being and you live and get forced into a situation like you're saying, perhaps what happened is in a short amount of time that these uh, the hominids the, the, that we that we come from were in a in a isolated area. I think that's fascinating. One of the people uh, that were was was watching your presentation was they were they wanted to see a map of where this island was. And I think, you know, especially when you talk about expansion tectonics, which if, like you said, I agree with you 100%, the evidence is overwhelming. It, that's the way the earth is right. I mean, you can sit there and pretend it's not, it, it is. So it, I think it'd be really interesting to try to put together when this island happened, is it possible 
maybe they go looking for fossils in that area, even though they would be maybe under the sea now. I mean, where where is this island? Where was it? And do do is there maps? Is that something you studied more or? Well, the, uh, the, the uh, map is in the book, okay? And the, the island is right at the mouth of the Red Sea. Uh, the Danica Alps, uh, what it is, if you look at the Red Sea, that's where the three plates separated. The uh, area where Lucy was found was in that Afar Triangle that was ripped up, uh, which uh, the upper portion was uh, ripped apart and is part of the uh, of the Saudi Arabian area now. The bottom part is, is that northeast uh, area of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the African Rift Valley, which is now uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia and Somalia. That, if you know that area. So you take a look at the very northern portion of that area, just off of that, uh, that very northern portion right at the edge of the Red Sea, which is uh, the mountains, the Danical uh, mountains, they, they're still there. They're there. It's the area towards Africa, uh, which was, when it uh, was pulled apart, flooded instantaneously from the Red Sea. Uh, so isolating the tops of the Danical mountains. So if, if you... Uh, if you if you go on Google, look uh, just type in Afar Triangle. You should you should you should be able to see that area uh, uh, and uh, the uh, and understand that Lucy was found in that area that was submerged at that time. Okay, it was submerged at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. Eh. All right, we have some people in the green room, I call it. Dennis is here, James, Ray. Did any of you want to come up and ask a question or make any comments? Uh, if you do want to come on live, you can do that by going to uh, this. Uh, uh, if you type in live.naturalphilosophy.org, you can come into the area, uh, our, what I call a green room, and I can put you up here live to talk with Mike and ask him questions or discuss something. I have Dennis here. Let's bring up Dennis. Hey Dennis, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Can you hear me? Oh yes, we can. Okay, uh, there's a book uh, by a mathematician from University of Oxford in uh, United Kingdom, which uh, shows that if the existence of DNA, which runs all life, uh, makes it incredibly improbable that the theory of evolution could be true. It's just even if you have a billion years, that's nothing compared to what you actually need for evolution to even possibly work. And this uh, this probability is so small that it's not like winning the Powerball Lotto, which people do all the time. It's like winning it a hundred times in a row uh, with one ticket each time. Which just but you're not. Matter. You're what you're what you're talking right now is. Oh, I'm gonna mute you because you got you got a feedback. But what you're what you're talking about now is just is not really the aquatic ape. You're you're making a much broader statement about evolution in general. Is that right? That's correct. And but a, a general statement includes all particulars. No, I understand that. Um, one of the things is 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 one of the arguments against that argument that it can that it happens in very small is a very simple examples of human beings that have been born all completely hairy, and that was not a. Um, that was literally a gene change. It was not a. Oh, it wasn't a million years that had taken to get a person who literally <laughs> were born that way. So one of the things is is that a lot of these things exist in our genes if they get turned on and turned off. Right, right. Th those those things can happen literally from one person to another. So I mean I understand what you're saying about the time frame, but uh, again. I, I appreciate that that argument, and I think that's totally great. I mean, people have uh, go ahead, uh, Mike, on that. Yeah, well, evolution has been shown to be mostly very quick, not slow. That once a, a species is isolated, the evolutionary process proceeds very quickly yeah. uh, because uh, in order to survive and adapt, the uh, if it, 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 
It, that was shown from what Darwin saw in, on the islands. And uh, we, we see from species all over the world, what, when you become isolated, uh, the, uh, the species adapts quickly because the, the DNA has within it that possibility uh, uh, right away. So this is a, uh, a, an argument which really is uh, refuted by existence, by what change, yes, change can happen very slowly if it's only by chance here but uh, most evolution does not place, take place slowly it almost always new species almost exclusively arrive when there is a sudden uh, change in the environment uh, isolation and then it happens very quickly because otherwise uh, the uh, animals will not survive uh, but uh, in this book, and God Created the Earth by Professor uh, Edward Baudreau, who used to be a member of the MPA, I think he's deceased now, and his student Eric Baxter points out that uh, the uh, Earth, that the all this uh, uh, dating that you talk about, 100% of it is based on uh, radioactive dating. But uh, in this book, he explains that radioactive, this hypothesis behind radioactive dating is that uh, you, you, uh, you can't change the half-life of an, of an element. But uh, you can change the half-life of an element. He points that out as one of the references in this book. And so radioactive dating is very suspicious. Now, also, Bill Lucas, you know, uh, has a... Uh, a Bush book out, which I, if you email me, I can uh, send you a copy of it. Uh, he gave it to me as a PDF file that shows that the Earth is about 8,000 years old. No, I just understand, and I do know about those arguments, and I appreciate that. I know that people in the group have that, and that there's a lot of, of, of considered uh, evidence to put forward for that. Um, I, I think that's you know, that's another discussion more or less. Like you said, it does involve this. And that if, if there is no evolution, how can we even talk about, about this? Then I, that's understood. But I, I do want to thank you for bringing that up. And again, we give form to everybody here. So uh, um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dennis. So, uh, you know, that it, it, I, think what's, I think one of the interesting things is, is that um, I have this other idea too about, oh, because, you know, it is true. If you really, st in your mind, I, I mean, I, my degree's in math. If you go and you say there's these small incremental changes, there's no way you could get all this variety in this amount of time, right? There has to be these shocks. Now, one of the things I'm, I was uh, also thinking is that it seems there's could be even adaptations in genes, meaning if you move, if the humans move into a place that the the growth of hair is going to be affected literally by the environment within the species in one person themselves and that even when the next generation is born those things then literally are almost like we're almost adaptive where you can throw this human out there and things will change species will do that that if you would it be the case that even uh, elephants, if elephants all of a sudden were found in areas that were getting colder and colder, would that make one of the genes flip in uh, a, a baby elephant where that elephant all of a sudden is going to have hair? Um, so, I mean, this whole idea of evolution itself is still, I mean, I, I know Dennis is talking about one idea, but it's still, even that, there's so much out there that's not really being looked at. Well, if you bring up the question of hair, we have as many hair follicles as a gorilla. Right. We have that. So what's the big change? If we, if, if we were faced at, for our survival in an icy world, obviously the, it would not be a great change for your body to become hairy, to protect against the cold. It is because you already have the hair there. They just aren't protruding. So it is, uh, you know, I find this whole argument to, uh, an attack on physics itself. Not just uh, a, a question, uh, the question of God 
is the very question that physics answers in that uh, its basic law is uh, that a matter and a motion of matter cannot be created or uh, uh, or uh, gotten rid of, only transformed. You, uh, you, uh, you, uh, therefore, there cannot have been a beginning. There cannot be an end. All you have is an infinite amount of matter moving through space and time. That's it. That's what, what uh, you, uh, other, uh, because the bad basic law of physics denies the possibility of a creation event and denies the, the possibility of an end event. Well, yeah, it, because, yeah, I, I know, for instance, I know my, my dad's very religious and he believes in infinite time. Now, does, you know, the Big Bang not happening has not changed his belief, but he is a scientist like us who looks at things and, you know, we have a model of the universe that makes everything physical moving mass and it's constantly changing, etc. And I think the other thing, though, too, Mike, is the way I would look at it is that when people, when I see people who try, for instance, they have a belief system, and I'll give you some examples. You believe that the world, that light is transmitted by ether. So you then go and try to fit everything into that idea that the that there's ether, and you put gravity in there. You put everything everything you can into that. Um, if you, for instance, believe that the world was created, that there's a god, and it's eight thousand years, you're going to look at and perhaps I don't know cherry pick, but at least look at things that are going to support that idea. And I think that's what some of the things that happen because one of the books I read, I can't remember, it's the I think it's called The Dating Game. And The Dating Game was one of those things when I first heard of um, um, the, uh, Bill Lucas's work, which I love Bill Lucas. His work is, is fantastic. I don't agree with his uh, explanation of, of the dating uh, of rocks being different. I read you know, as much as I could about how that's done. Now, yeah, could it be that way? Of course. But um, no. I think that I think what I'm saying is, is it a possibility? Yes. Is it if does the evidence show? It? I think there's overwhelming evidence. No, that things are that old. But I'm what I'm saying is that people's like you were talking in the beginning, people have a belief system and they're going to try to put everything into it. Another example is Electric Universe. I love Electric Universe people. They are open-minded. They try different things. They look at the world in a different way. Um, they look at it as an electric, but a lot of them put everything as an electric, everything. Right. And, right. And, 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 and I think, you know, I agree with them. There's a lot of stuff out there that can be explained by uh, electrical forces, but not all of it. It, it. You know, this whole idea that you're always... And so the belief systems that people have, and they try to put things in. So I think that's part of it with the creationist part. If you believe there's a God and you believe there's creation, for instance, if you're a Christian and you believe that the earth is this, this, this old, you're going to try to find things that will agree with that. And of course... The world is open. The universe is open for each one of us in our brains to have the right to go and look at those things, have the right to try to show those. So I mean, well, let me disagree a little bit, okay? Because yes, we all have a right to believe whatever we want. But we as a science have to uh, uh, adhere to basic laws of physics. And that basic law of physics that I just quoted is the basic law really for infinity? And if if your uh, if uh, that basic law clearly indicates that there's no beginning and no end, but that, and that a matter and the motion of matter are permanent, they can only be transformed. Sure. Sure. Uh, therefore, that's the basis of evolution. Because if matter is constantly in motion, that means by definition that change is constant. Yes, absolutely. And evolution, all evolution is saying is change is constant. Uh, is constant. And that when we look at an object, a human, a rock, a star, uh, anything, we are looking at something in transition. You are not looking at something that is. Because the past is the past, the future is the future, and now can never be pointed to. Because you, you try to point to now, it's in the past. So we're, what we have is a, uh, 
constantly changing uh, uh, universe that is not uh, uh, something that was ever created, that it will ever end, and that where things change, not because we will it, but because in, it is a requirement in an infinite universe. No, I understand. Yeah, I just, you know, it gets down to a bit pedantic as discussions. For instance, my father and I, we agree on one thing. There are no laws. We, we make up laws, right? The universe is the universe. But I do agree. I do agree with infinity. I do agree that mass and motion, that's all that's happening. I do agree in change. Um, I guess you know, do you know Glenn Borkert's work then, I would imagine? Well, he, uh, in fact, me and Glenn spoke at, 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 at a forum together on this whole issue several years ago at the New School in New York. Uh, so, uh, yes, I am very well acquainted with Glenn. We, we, uh, we've talked many, many times, and we, we agree on a lot of things. They just be a little bit on the here and there, but mostly, uh, uh, basically, we're pretty much in, a, in, in agreement on a lot of things. No, no, yeah. So I, I can tell that. No, and I think that's it's that's really okay. Um, I know there's James and Ray. Did any of you want to come up and make any co comments in the green room? Just wave your hand if you do. Okay, I do have uh, James. Go ahead, James. You there? You are. You're on mute. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, it takes a while. We're ten mm -hmm. second delay. Yeah. Yeah, he's unmuting himself. So I'm going to remove him. Maybe that'll help him get the. Uh, um, he's not listening. What happens sometimes when they, people start talking, they don't listen. you got to unmute yourself, James. We weren't hearing you. Let's try again. Now, Hi, uh, Mike, great presentation. Thank you very much. Are Thank we you. to uh, assume that uh, the variety of uh, pre-modern human species, Neanderthals, those in Africa, and others elsewhere, are all descendants of the aquatic uh, yes. man uh, yes. group that that you uh, define. Thank you. I'll just listen to your answer. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, there's no evidence to the contrary. It seems that all of the uh, all of Homo goes back to the lowest common ancestor, which appears to have arrived in that our far triangle. Uh, we don't have the, all the connections. I, as I said, the, between Homo erectus and, and Lucy is a big gap, but, uh, we, uh, but all of us, all, and our DNA shows that we are linked all the way back uh, to Lucy. Oh, sorry, I was clicking on something that wasn't happening, boy. <laughs> this thing's not broken. Well, listen, um, we're coming up to the end here. It was absolutely fantastic. I want to thank, first of all, Nick Nick uh, Percival for having too. Put, push, to push you forward. Yeah. Because uh, even though I knew about this idea, it was still, um, I, I, I really didn't think of it. It's not something we normally have here, although I do like uh, and it is a tradition of our organization, as you know, uh, Dr. D Domina Spencer used to do that, where we would have people that were a little bit on the outside of physics and cosmology, but there was a, there was some uh, link there. But uh, I really want to thank you. I think um, this sort of, the way I would picture this, uh, Mike, this sort of falls in the same as extent as uh, expansion tectonics. Absolutely. It's something. It's it's something that has obvious clues obvious things you know like you said walking upright skin that's you know no no hair um those and, and other things like the larynx that's a huge thing what what you know what is it going to take it's going to take uh, the ability for people who are cr critical enough to say okay let's step back because what i would like to see is to look at the aquatic ape and then look at the evidence and then go and adjust it it's i think people have this idea always with expansion tectonics or you don't believe in the big bang or relativity's wrong or particle physics needs to be thrown out that that you are now abandoning everything that in science over the millennium that that has gone and you're just redoing it it's not true it's the same with the aquatic ape you are not doing anything violating anything that um scientific method 
uh, requires. You are simply saying that there is a gap there that needs to be explained, and we need to look at it and try to come up with the answers. Yes, Elaine Morgan in her book says essentially that she kept pleading with the Darwinists to come and debate it. Come on, let's have a discussion of this. And they wouldn't do it. Yeah. And, you know, they, this is the same problem we have in the physics. We have the same problem with the expanding Earth. You can see the Earth expanding. You can look at it. You can see it. You can't see any subduction zones. You don't see any upside down volcanoes putting stuff back in. You can see the Earth expanding with your own eyes. And but they won't look. They I know. Look. I know. I mean, a good example. Yeah. <laughs> A good example of that, Glenn Borkert, which I think is one of the greatest scientists of our generation, Glenn Borkert, with his infinity and work on that. He, he doesn't believe in expansion tectonics, even though he says there's a heck of a lot of uh, evidence for it. So, yeah. Yes. But, but I, one of my disagreements with yeah, him. Yeah. Yes. No, but uh, he, I, I always tell him, it's, it doesn't matter. You, you're still going down history for your work. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much, Mike. Um, and maybe what we can do is let's talk offline about the possibility about your other work, which is a talking about this worldview that people have that sort of makes them not look to be critical thinkers right like even yeah. today oh i don't want to watch that aquatic ape because well they don't want to have their boat rocked they don't want yeah. they don't want to have to look outside and say you know these questions do have to be answered and these yeah. this idea of aquatic ape has some real answers they don't want to go outside their comfort zones right, right. so so let's let's talk about that and uh, i we've got to go because we were at the end okay but thank you so much and uh, i hope thank to have you, you back Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, listen, that was absolutely great. I want to thank everybody who's uh, uh, come in and out of this. I know I've seen a lot of people uh, watching this today. I want to thank um, Nick Percival again, not only for his patronage to this group and his generous uh, uh, givings to this group, but also for indicating Mike uh, uh, Gimbel, who is uh, just so much a, a great representative of what our group and these amazing critical thinkers are one of the most amazing um journeys i've ever had was to be involved with the mpa and now in the cmps i have met more uh incredible minds in this group than all the books i've ever read uh in mainstream science because these people truly will sit down and try to find the truth because they they don't look for something to be famous they don't look to something to fit into their worldview whether it be everything is this or everything is ether or whatever it is these people really will stand back and try to look at what what is uh going on in the universe and like a kid saying clean slate let me see what the possibilities are so Hey, it's been great to be back. We'll see you next time we get together. And remember what I always say, stay critical, stay thinking. I am your science therapist, David DeHills, trying to get you to the promised land of becoming a cr critical thinker. Ciao for now.